Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome, listeners, and I'm thrilled to be introducing our next guest, Jason Pike. He's the author of A Soldier Against All Odds, and I do hope you'll stick around for this very inspiring uh, conversation as we are going to be joining um, retired Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike, a decorated combat veteran. And as I mentioned, the author of this very compelling book, A Soldier Against All Odds. In his captivating memoir, Jason shares his remarkable journey of resilience and triumph. And he has faced unimaginable adversity while serving his country. And it in and it didn't all come from the enemy. A pivotal moment in Jason's life occurred when his father died shortly before his deployment overseas. Struggling to navigate the depths of grief, he found himself confronted by the destructive actions of someone he served with, who maligned his character and identity. Yet, in the face of such adversity, Jason managed to not only grieve his loss, but also remained steadfast in his commitment to his duties, ensuring the safety and well-being of the men that served under him. A Soldier Against All Odds, as I've mentioned, is where Jason will dive deep into these profound challenges he's faced, and it will offer us valuable insights, dear listeners, and how one can endure heartache, fulfill responsibilities, and emerge even stronger than before. Through his indomitable spirit, Jason's story serves as a beacon of hope for anyone grappling the loss, adversity, and questioning their ability to persevere. Before we go any further, listeners, please join me in welcoming our guest today, Jason Pike, to the show. Welcome, Jason. Yes, Anne. It's sunny here in Texas, and um, I'm looking forward to getting down into the details on the book and and my life, my life story. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Oh, it's sunny. It's sunny where you are in Texas. It's it's snowy up here in Ottawa, Canada. (laughs) Okay. All right. (laughs) No, listeners, this is not going to be an interview uh, discussing the weather. This is just (laughs) one of the things we tend to do. (laughs) Jason, when I was sort of preparing for this, I couldn't help but just be blown away. Here you are. You're retired from the military after 31 years of service, and thank you for serving your country as you have. I feel I ought to be, you know, standing up and saluting you. It, I don't know, there's something about when you're talking to a vet, it pulls at your heartstrings for what they've endured. As long as I get paid, that's all I'm concerned with. Uh, <laughs> that's what my respect comes from the paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was a lot deeper, but we'll go with that for the moment. So as I mentioned, you've retired after 31 years. You had nine years of being overseas and you're also a, a decorated combat vet and you've lived in five countries. And I understand you've survived a wicked amount of military training. <laughs> Oh, yeah. A lot of I mean, I didn't go into all the schools that I had. I've had over 30 various military schools, not just the hard stuff, the yelling and screaming schools, which are minimal. It's really a lot of the brick and mortar and the academic training. I've had a whole lot of training. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what you mean by the wicked amount of 
training. Mm-hmm. I, I, for, for a non-military person, I imagine it being lots of push-ups and having mm-hmm. somebody shouting in your face, which I have to admit would totally have destroyed me. <laughs> so hats off to anybody that gets through that initial training. But where I wanted to go with this, Jason, was even looking back on your training and your your time in the military, what an incredible accomplishment because let's just take a moment to pause and have you feel proud of what you actually achieved. Well, yes, I'm very proud of it. I wrote a book on it and uh, and, and once I wrote the book and that's when I became even much more proud of it after I had to get over that hurdle of writing the book. Yeah. Yeah. Writing is not easy, especially when it's about ourselves. What I like to presence is that you've had many, many challenges and they began in your younger years, didn't they, Jason? Would you Mm -hmm. like to share when all that that began? Uh, So when I was, I failed the first grade because I was diagnosed in 1972, many years ago, as having a learning disability. At the time, you didn't talk about that stuff. You didn't talk about someone uh, mentally uh, or intellectually challenged. That was not a word. Uh, It just, it was just known that reading and writing are not, are my worst subjects and they still, and they remained and just following basic instructions that are written down or even just changing a light bulb. It takes me more energy or more uh, concentration than the average person. Most of your viewers out there, I'm sure, can do better on any standardized test than me. But I make up it through, I make up with a lot of these challenges that I had through just extra hard work. But no, that was one of the big ones was the uh, uh, the learning disability. And then at age nine, I had a a physical problem, which was uh, osteomyelitis which was a bone mm-hmm. disease. So, mm-hmm. and I, but pain and failure, that was painful, the bone disease. I got over that with antibiotics in the seventies. Okay. But um, pain and failure were just introduced to me as a part of life. I didn't think of it any differently. So um, that's kind of how I was set up. Yeah. You know? Okay. Well, just having those learning disabilities, as you mentioned, and then having osteomyelitis, which is any bone disease is very, very painful. You were able to get uh, it. Well, it sounds like it resolved through antibiotics. Was it something that came through later on in life? Was it an ongoing process for you? I I had on when I was in the military service, I had some clicks and clangs and I had some treatment, but it was something I never talked about. Uh, It's the same with the learning disability. I did not want to show any weakness to the military in which they may want to process me out. Uh, so I was very, uh, and and I was just raised in, a, in an environment where you don't complain and you don't, you know, don't make any excuses up. So, uh, and about the military is about the only thing I felt that I could probably do. And there was not a whole lot of other expectations. And so uh, I wanted to stay on to that as much as I could. You know. So oh, that's interesting with that, that you went on to to pursue a life in the military. So you mentioned the learning disability, it being a challenge for you. How did you manage to navigate that? I mean, a, a retired mm. lieutenant colonel? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a chapter in my book called Where There's a Wheel, There's an A, like the letter grade A, um, uh, John Ritter, he was a movie star. He's deceased now, but he came out way back in the early eighties with a tape on how to study. It's called where there's a will, there's an A. And I just borrowed that. And I, I, I yeah, it's like anything else in life. You, you give, you have a bunch of tools, but you don't use every one of them. You use ones, ones that work on you. And so what I would do is, uh, I would, uh, in three by five index cards. I had a little tape recorder, I sat at the front of the class. I was on time, maybe before, and, and um, I showed interest. And I and I I just used various tips and techniques that helped me along the way. And I went slower. I didn't I didn't cram everything, and uh, so I was able to get my degree and, and that now with the college with that. And um, the army was much more easier to me than the uh, college, but. Um, 
because they they, tell, they 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 teach it at the lowest level, but in a college, they teach it at a much higher level, at least I thought so. And uh, so uh, that's how I got around a lot of things with just various, and I would apply those study habits. To, uh, and, that, and that was the biggest hurdle was getting through college. Getting through college, uh, it just blew everybody away. They say, how in the hell did he go to college? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to yeah. me, that is an insight for our listeners that even if a child is showing that they have a, a disability or a, a health challenge, it doesn't mean that their life's over. You've just proven how applying some of the tips and tricks that you learned, you were able to navigate the system. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I navigated it pretty well. I was groomed into it. I joined when I was 17 years of age um, that I, <laughs> I was not even out of high school when I joined uh, at the time uh, that I was went to the reserves. You didn't have to have a high school diploma everything was from the bottom. I went from the bottom, uh, not only in academics, as far as going to a junior college. So I navigated it through a place where, you know, you had to go back to the basics for a little while at a, at a community college or a junior college, okay. and then go into a main university. But, uh, and then with the army, I started from the bottom rank and then navigated my way up. I didn't have any family members that were in the military that were advising me. Uh, my dad did serve in the Navy, but but I had to figure it out. And most of the things I had to figure out on my own, which was when I was growing up, there was not a lot of expectations put on me, um, maybe good or bad. But for to me, that was liberating because it allowed me to uh, figure out what I need to do and how I need to process and go through things. And uh, I had a creative streak in me that I didn't know existed um, and uh, I sort of exploited that once I got onto active duty, which is not which can get you in trouble in the military because creativity, they usually tell you to do things uh, exactly. But uh, I had to use a sense. I had a I had a different creative sense I had to to go through a little bit of a, a rogue and a rebel streak as well. But uh, um, yeah, I, I, I navigated it pretty well because I did go to lieutenant colonel. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Just knowing a little bit about your background, you just sort of opened the door up there. You, you um, potentially um, questioned those in the higher uppers about what it was you were asked to do. And I can't imagine that was uh, met with. with no, they, they, I mean, one of the things is they said I could not become a medical service corps officer. Okay. Um, but I, because you have to have a doctor's degree, but I found occupations in the medical service corps that did not require a doctor's degree. And I went in there and uh, a lot of the things they told me I couldn't do, I challenged. And uh, I got, matter of fact, even getting in trouble, which I did in the military and almost got kicked out with a driving under the influence charge. I challenged that and appealed it successfully, which was at the time considered impossible uh, when I was writing the book, just, just doing that is really, I mean, that's considered dishonorable uh, to do that. We have a higher standard of behavior in the military. And if you get caught doing certain things, they'll process you out. But I was able to work around that with my creativity and uh, stay in, stay in the military uh, and move on throughout the ranks. And, uh, but there was just one thing after the other uh, that would come up and I would, challenge it and uh I would actually become a success, success uh working through things yeah wow so it sounds like having no expectations as you say allowed you to chart your own way and do it on your own and I can't imagine if you had have had expectations by your parents or uh, friends or society how you would have probably rebelled or balked against those mm -hmm. anyway wouldn't you <laughs> I think I would. Now you have my my brother. He had he was the one that was going to be considered to carry the family flag forward on academics. He was uh, he was much better than me, and they did put expectations on him. Mm. Um, and he was in line and step with the program, the family program of yeah, you know. Yeah. And I was the one on the other side, and um, uh, he he did well. We both did well, but we. 
I, I probably had much more adventure and time overseas and fun in life than he did. He kind of went by what was expected of him. I kind of went all over the place. And um, I think uh, I think I had much more fun in life. Uh, not that it's over or not. It's just, I think, than my brother. That's just, that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah he followed what's the, the expectations, which are placed on so many of us, aren't they? This is how we have to do life. And it sounds like you were able to, as I say, chart your own course, but you got to experience life at a different, at a higher level. You were a risk taker. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, very much so. I jumped out of airplanes and helicopters and was in nine, you know, five different countries around the world, I've traveled the world. And uh, I was sort of a little bit of adrenaline junkie. And I, and I, my daughter now has that little trait on her and she's my daughter's in Europe right now. And she was in Columbia, South America. She's traveling and doing things that uh, most 22 year olds wouldn't do. But uh, I have to say, that's probably my fault. That I allowed her to do that, but that's fine. I'm cool with it. Um, I know that she should do the right thing. Yeah. You'll be okay to, yeah. to, to navigate it. I navigate it. Yeah. So you, what you obviously learned from a very early age how to begin to navigate all of these challenges and even just writing a book Jason as you mentioned you have learning disabilities how how did that uh work out for you how were you well, able to navigate that yeah yeah that that nearly killed me actually I mean um but what I did was I didn't know any ghostwriter I knew I needed help I mean even if I knew how to write uh, which I don't. Well, I, I'm a writer. I'm a good writer. I mean, what I'm saying is I got the book out, but uh, it, it, it's, it's it's been up between number one and number 10, but I had to get help and I went through a website to bid out my project and mm. I hired a ghostwriter. And from there, we went through multiple Zooms and we went through multiple meetings. He came and visited me and the family and we just got into details. Uh, just, it just, almost just emotionally obliterated me. And it, then it was a multiple obliterations of just questions and answering and over and over. And then once I saw it down on paper, I'm thinking, oh God, I, I don't know if I want everybody to know it. And uh, But he told me and reassured me that a good book uh, it will really, uh, you know, the more deeper uh, and more you give, the better off it will, it will be. And uh, that put me in the hospital, seeing that, the anxiety, the fear, what are they going to think about me? Uh, I'm not good enough. Uh, all these things. Uh, I, I went to the hospital with blood clots. I didn't know how to write. And I, I, and I had told the writer that, and I needed it. I mean, just, I mean, to, to read a paragraph, it's one thing, but to read a paragraph or two and it's your life and you're, it just did a number on me in multiple ways. And so what I did, well, the, I was diagnosed to die uh, in February, 2021 uh, in Texas. I had the obituary, we had the end of life procedures done. Um, I was on uh, oxygen and I was on, um, I had pneumonia and blood clots. The blood clots were in my lungs and my legs. And um uh, that it was pretty much known. I mean, I know it's a bad, and when you've got a pneumonia on that, it wasn't COVID. It was not COVID. It mm. was just my own. They thought I had smoked. I said, I've never smoked, but I told them I've been in a whole lot of stress and been sitting down for a long time. I was in the ICU for three days. My body, uh, it reacted very well to the heparin blood thinner and to the, the antibiotics for the pneumonia. I came back went into a different stage of the hospital to where uh, three more days, and then I was able to get wheelchaired out. But um, that, and everybody, everybody couldn't believe, well, one, I lived. Number two, how did you get into that situation? Because I, working out, for me, I work out, uh, I always worked out, but I, I just sat down and I stressed and the stress and all the whatever caused a whole big number on my body. And, um, that was the hardest thing post retirement I've ever done. It might be one of the hardest things in my life, probably in the top three that I went through was just writing the book. But what I learned is that no one really, once you've got dirty laundry and you give it out, then it's no longer dirty laundry. What you once you say, okay, I'm this, or this is the way it was, then most people, oh wow, they're either going to be impressed or not impressed. 
but there's nobody, no one wanted to, the army nor nobody else wanted to come back and try to kill me or try to hurt me or cause me problems or anything that I thought of. So all that fear was in my head and it was not a reality. What you are talking about is if we don't deal with our emotions, they are going to go internally into our bodies. And it almost sounds with your ghostwriter, that could have been your therapist. It sounds as if that was cathartic for you, as difficult as it was going into the depths and really staring at those emotions in the face probably was harder than staring an enemy <laughs> when you were in, in active uh, duty. Oh, yes, uh, it was. No doubt about that. I would have rather gone to war anytime than to see my life for the first time written out. Uh, mm-hmm. I can detail with the stories and how they flowed. It was just it just did a number to me. I couldn't, sometimes I was scared to look at the computer or the document. Sometimes I had to take a week off and, uh, mm-hmm. and I knew it more than anybody else. I'd lived it, but the number to, 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 to look at it, I had to have a few different people and it was just a tough, it was uh, one of the toughest times that, yeah, that I, it was cathartic and um, I had to, cr- I cried, uh, I laughed, I, all the uh, various emotions of, uh, I got all the various emotions that you have in life, I went through them, they're, they're right there in, in, in front of me, and uh, to, to to do that was, uh, that was a tough one, it was tough. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. I'm certainly glad that you, uh, even though you had the last rites and your eulogy was all prepared, that you are sitting here talking to us, and clearly yeah. you're very much <laughs> you're, you're here there's there's more for you to do yet isn't there Jason oh yeah. yeah when you were going through all that with your ghost rider did you actually have a therapist that was sort of helping you with all these emotions uh, I had been through therapy like two or three different years after retirement so oh. I went through a whole bunch of therapy before uh, one of the biggest uh, therapeutic sessions I had that didn't me help before I wrote the was EMDR, which is a, yeah. yeah and that was like this, this is tapping or this left, right, left process that happened. I had been through that a lot. And um, so when I was with the book, when I was with the ghostwriter, I was just talking and talking and talking. Then I wrote it down. Well, I didn't write it down. He wrote it down. And then we went through it again and again. And then I did the, I have the audio book. I am the, I am the narrator and yeah. that I read it over and over and over. And that brought up more stories. Uh, what made it even uh, because I was just I was still even though it had been two to three years by going through the audio book, we amended the original document because with talking, I was able to say this happened, this happened, this happened. So we got it even better with the audio book. <laughs> so um, that's kind of how the process was. I, so I really didn't have a no, I didn't have a counselor at that time. I had been through. I was just too, oh, I was just too busy. Just, uh, just, just, uh, and, and I just, I was in a, in a state of anxiety a lot during that time. And, uh, I, yeah. So my, uh, my, my writer, he worked for his money because he had to go through and see me go through all the emotions. Yeah. He sat and ha- held your hand as you were doing it. Was there a real, uh, fear then of the army coming back or the military coming back and, yeah, sure was, because I had been federally investigated, and uh, I thought that might come back. Federal inge- investigation of espion, which was all, it was all total false, and nothing came out in court. But I felt that with the people that did that to me, they may want to do something, uh, and they didn't. They didn't do that, so uh, I was fearful of putting out. Even secrets of long ago of driving under the influence and how I got out of it, I was fear of reprisals against. There's only about four enemies that I have out there, but um, really, I, I but nothing ever happened. Nothing even happened remotely online. Nothing derogatory or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So at least you can now lay that ghost fear ghost to rest. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, that makes me more stronger to do much more projects, and it gives me. I mean. I look back at that. I'm thinking if that didn't, I mean, that was, and then I I feel that I can do many more projects without any fear of doing it. Uh, So, yeah. So you've really grown with all (laughs) the 
challenges. Yes. And that was one of the uh, incidents that I mentioned that you had been m- maligned when you were going through it. So thank you for bringing that. Um, going back to something I mentioned in the beginning, that your dad died just as you were about to go yeah. to Afghanistan, I think yeah. you mentioned. That was a tough time, very tough time. I, it was really, I know you talked about my dad dying, and that's true, and then going to Afghanistan, and that was true. So I had just been under a federal investigation where my own authorities in the military falsely charged me with espionage against the U.S. government. And I never really talked about that for many years. Um, but right after I came back, right when that event was uh, was getting over with, I came back to go see my father pass away and go to his grave site. At that same time, they had me going to Afghanistan. So I was really busy getting the unit into Afghanistan. And I was fearful of uh, leaving my family, which had been a great support network uh, while I go to war. But I was going to war in a very weakened state of condition, um, well, I'm, mentally and emotionally. My state was, my dad had died, but more importantly, a big core part of me had been taken out, which was, uh, you know, being honorable to the United States military. Now, I, I do admit I have a rogue side, I have a character side, but I've never been sort of des. Uh, Deslo, I never sold secrets to uh, foreign nationals or anything like that. So mm-hmm. I had a core piece of me that was missing uh, of who I was. Uh, there was, and then my dad died, and that was another part that left. I could have been, men- in matter of fact, I did go to counseling. I could have been declared as mentally incapable of going to war mm-hmm. because I had so much going on in my head, and they would have signed the letter to get me out of going to Afghanistan, which I almost did. But I talked to my uncle, and he says. What would your dad want you to do? Mm. (laughs) So um, that right there, I decided to uh, pick my feet up, you know, get up and uh, go ahead and go. Uh, But every fiber in me told me not to go just because I I did. I didn't feel I could do it. And well, so I went over there and I told my soldiers, I only told them one thing, which was my father passed away. I didn't tell them about the federal investigation. And Mm. they uh, they went ahead and. uh, said, you know, uh, we'll help you out. We'll help you. We're, we're sorry for you. We're sorry, but they'll help me out. And they were probably helping me out better than anybody else, even though I was a leader. And we went over there and did our time. And really, Afghanistan was just a minor aggravation of what was already going on. Uh, I was grieving my father. And I was also paranoid about that federal investigation that had been on. And so uh, suicide bombers or bombs that came in on me, I, I was not scared of it anymore. I, I I I felt that if I was in a state where if if it kills me, it kills me. I'm not scared anymore to die. I was the last one running out of the tent when the bombs came in, which made my soldiers very angry because they didn't want me to die. I mm-hmm. felt I had a death wish uh, and I wasn't scared, which is not the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. But um, that's how my mental state was in, when I was in war in Afghanistan. Um, uh, and I just felt uh, I just get I. So I wasn't stressed out about the immediate death effects because I was sort of a zombie or a sort of a numb. I felt I was in a numb. I was just, you know, I was gonna say in a numb situation. You yeah. had numbed yourself out, hadn't you? And naturally so. I mean, just the fact because you were very close to your father. I know when we spoke before, you shared uh, your great love for him, and your uncle saying, "What would your dad do?" Yeah. What would your dad think? What would your dad, what would your dad want you to do? And I was like, well, I know the answer to that. And so, um, and so I decided not to get the letter from the counselor to get out. And yeah. And in, in, and in, and in hindsight, I'm glad I went. Um, at the time I was just in a complete shambles. Uh, mm-hmm. I could not, uh, but, um, I, uh, I did go and, just, you know, one day at a time and things. And uh, it's not that, and, and, and in many ways, it was a chance for me to get away. And, oh, yeah, there's another positive. I thought there would be a, be a time to be redeemed from the dead. Uh, my name was considered mud, I felt at that time. And I said, if I do well in war, come back, I might be taken down from the cross or I might rise from the dead. And, and then that's, and in, and in many ways, that's what happened. I came back, I, I got the bronze star, which is a, a high award from combat. And 
they said, hey, whatever you want to go next, it's your choice. You've done well. And I did. And then I was I was still I was burned out when I came back, uh, still burned out, still processing. And then I went to Germany and just got off of active duty. After two years, I was totally burned. I needed I needed professional help when I got out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just being in that sort of situation um, and, and as you say, being numbed out, two big losses, because your identity would have been hugely tied up in in having your name be, I mean, my goodness, who, who wants that to be taken through? You're a traitor to your country. Oh, my goodness, that must have mm-hmm. been a nightmare for you. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But also... I, I loved how you said the men took care of you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They took care of me once. If you just tell that, I, I had to tell them that, that I had something wrong with me. And uh, I didn't, instead of talking about the federal investigation, which was just as big or bigger than my father, I just told him my father died and I'm I'm not in my good state. And I just mm-hmm. says, I, I need you to sort of check after me. And they did. And they, they checked on me, checked on this, checked on that. Hey, sir, are you fine? You forgot about this. Did you, did you remember to do this and things just keeping me on track? And um, <clears throat> that kept me, that helped me out. So, because yeah. um, I knew I needed that. Yeah. For <laughs> sure. And that is another thing that I don't think people recognize when there is a, a death. You're unable to think and process the same way as you once did. Mm-hmm. So it was wonderful that they were there to sort of check up on you and that must have been a relief because mm-hmm. you could possibly have spent a little bit more time processing or mm-hmm. yeah. did you sort of not even bother while you were there yeah they did i did a whole lot of processing in afghanistan and uh i just allowed them to do what they need to do and allow me to do my grieving uh, a lot for the most part i remember working out very, very hard uh, doing left, right, left processing and uh, emotional processing with uh, various machines, walking around the Shindan airfield with my weights, processing alone, things of that nature. So I did a whole lot of that. And I, and I was the leader at the time. And I just said, I'm just powering it down to you. Try to, you know, let me process this and get on out of here. And yeah, like you said, my ability to know what to do as far as using a calendar or using just basic things that I'd normally taken for granted um, that, that took me more effort to do things. Even I'd already have a learning disability, but my, my ability to do things was much, much lower, comprehend things, understand yeah. things of that nature. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I honestly don't think that corporations, leaders, executives truly understand what grief does to a person. You are not a productive person when you're in that state you might be a warm body occupying a seat at your desk but you probably aren't you might be 50 70 percent available to whatever is going on in a on a good day but yeah to navigate your everyday life at that level that you would have had you would have been expected to have would have been a massive undertaking so I'm glad that your men stepped up and you all managed to get out of there alive mm-hmm. and you got the the bronze star was it you said yeah the bronze star we were doing we and matter of fact the the team did very very well in Afghanistan and um uh, yes, we had lots of accolades, a lot of praise of, of the things that we did over there. And uh, it was sort of a redemption in a way, but I would uh, I had been I was kind of burned. And I, so that was a notch. That was a notch. That was a big, big notch uh, on my belt. Um, and all of our, we're really all of our belts, really. all It was a big, big accomplishment we had just to get out of there alive and have done the job that we did well. And uh, um, but um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you reflect back on that, does that sort of help to put salve on that wound that you would have had? Your identity had been tarnished. Did it help to shine it up a little bit? A little bit. I still held uh, a lot of resentment and anger. And uh, I was still not talking anything about it to nobody for years. I don't think I ever, I don't think I put the, that, the, 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 
I don't think I even talked about that. I didn't talk about that at all until the book started doing the book. And then we, uh, I couldn't talk about that for many years. And uh, so that was, I retired in 2014. I didn't say anything about the federal investigation until 2020, maybe six years. And, and I had been through a number of counseling sessions, a various amount, a good number of counseling and mental health um, for that and for other things, but mainly for that. That was the big one. Yeah. Okay, for sure. So there you are in Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. You were diagnosed, uh, burnt out. PTSD, PTSD. Uh, anxiety, anxiety. I had pretty much done everything. They gave me a really they gave me a really nice assignment after the after my war my wartime service. And it was a really chill, easy type of a job, but uh, I could not even still wa walking around like a zombie. I knew I needed to get out, and uh, I just I just go ahead, went ahead and got out from Germany. I only went to Germany because uh, my wife and my daughter wanted to go, and uh, I was ready to get out of the army. But I uh, went ahead and got to see a lot of Europe, and then process out. And the main thing I did once I process, and even while I was processing out or before I was doing a whole lot of uh, mental health, but then once I got back to Texas and I could stabilize with the uh, caregiver and things, I did much more intense levels and different types of techniques of uh, mental health. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask what sort of things you went through to mm -hmm. bring yourself back, because once you're in that collapse, burnt out state, You've mentioned PTSD, yeah, it, but it's a whole body thing, isn't it? The stress takes its toll on your adrenal glands. You've got all these, that's cortisol and all this anti-inflammatory stuff that excess cortisol will promote within your body. Like it's, uh, you must have been a walking minefield with all this going on. Yeah, so what yeah. sort of thing? you said you were processing but what sort of things did you do to help yourself because yeah so what, well first of all I just stopped working I didn't go to a job and I seeked uh, various types of <clears throat> some of these uh, therapy some of these uh, non-profit uh, organizations have a toolbox that you can go to and check out I'm, I would go for a week or two weeks and taste the different flavors of the menu of various types of counseling sessions. It could be the regular one-on-one -on -one counseling. It could be EMDR. It could be meditation. It could be yoga. It could be outdoor fly fishing. So there's many different techniques people uh, jump on uh, to use. Uh, uh, and so I sort of tasted a whole lot of menus. I worked out. I started working out uh, a lot, uh, became a a fitness trainer. I'm not, I'm not working on that, but I, that was another thing that always had helped me is uh, physical fitness. And I did that a whole lot. And I did that. And then I, uh, I got a job uh, as a uh, maintaining the trail system on the bicycle trail system here in Texas for a little while. That was, I had the, you know, when in the trails, uh, you ride your bicycle and you're in nature. So I use that and work as sort of a purpose, having a purpose as ther therapy, I do think, I, I think main thing is uh, work or have a purpose uh, in life. I think that's the main, that's one of the main things. Uh, and I thought that EMDR um, sort of helped me out better than any other techniques. And um, of course, physical fitness uh, daily. Another thing I found out that I just re redone in the past year or two, I don't, there's a, there's a heat, cold or contrast therapy where you get into a sauna and then you get into a cold bath. Uh, or it could be you're in a sauna or a hot tub and you get into a cold shower. It's that contrast effect that helps me uh, uh, reduce a lot of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So um, I, I think you've got to play around with what's good for you, just like you would go to a restaurant and see a menu. It yeah. may take a little bit to find the right uh, type of thing for you. I, I think that you just, if someone says you go here and that's all there is, there's more, there's more choices than just one choice out there. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So play around uh, and find a therapist that you feel comfortable with. And then a modality, yeah, EMDR I've heard is, I'm not sure if they consider it the gold standard now for PTSD or oh, no. there's, there's so many, but I know that was one that they were uh, readily using. And then I think the polyvagal theory with um, 
uh, porges, Dr. Porges, how to sort of lower that your stress levels, being mm. aware of that. And yeah, isn't it so interesting how that cold heat therapy, when you think Scandinavian countries have been doing that forever, haven't they? Forever. I mean, in Korea, South Korea, they do it too. And uh, what they have in South Korea is just something they do as a family. And they've been doing it and then they do it, yeah, in Europe. Uh, and so uh, so now it's kind of taking hold here. And I was telling the people, I went there today and I said, you know, this has been going on for years and years in other places. So, yeah. yeah. Now that the science is just catching up on what it's actually doing and helping in your body. Mm-hmm. What is it you would like the reader to take away when they pick up your book? Oh, it's it's again, it's inspiration, hope, survival, persistence. It's that same old thing, but someone who is a disabled learner, someone who had many challenges. I come from a background of the Southern United States uh, in storytelling, and I have a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, language that's from the South. Um, a soldier against all odds is my life story. Um, that you'll, I mean, it's between number one and number ten on Army Memoirs, according to Amazon. And so this is just an inspirational. It's funny as well. You'll take a lot of humor out of here. I pretty much t- lay it on the line. Uh, so uh, it, it could be with anybody, military or not military. And then I have another book. I've just It was a shorter book with a lot of links in it. It is out of the uniform and uh, back into civilian life. This is more for American veterans that want to get their benefits. That's mm-hmm. one thing I did very well. Coming, Most people don't. Most people have problems. That's why I wrote the book. But I personally did pretty well with it because I was so burned out. I just forget it. I said, I'm just going to study this. And I and, and there was nobody that wanted to help me over in Germany. So I had to do it myself, which took me a long time. But I'm a slow processor. But once I do it, I do pretty well. So that's the that's the one for the veterans. So, yeah, inspiration, hope, persistent survival. I know it's the same old thing you've probably heard, but uh, I put it in a different flavor. Yeah. yeah, that's it's well, absolutely. And I think there's so many vets out there that probably would benefit from it, mm. um, even if it was just to find inspiration and hope in a way that they might be able to gain their purpose back. Because sometimes it has to be a harsh adjustment coming from that life into civilian life how was that for you when you made that transition well it was mandatory for us to go to transitional classes but yeah it it was mandatory and I went through the transitional classes a lot but I knew I I knew at the time that I was going to need medical help before I could do anything I couldn't I didn't feel comfortable going to any type of job for a long time because I was just too burned I was a zombie Um, And so I had to go through uh, intense, uh, various types of things just, and that's pretty much what I did. And, um, and then uh, I got back to work. Uh, Once I got back to work, I started feeling more confident about being able to be, you know, being productive. Uh, And then once I started feeling productive, uh, then I started uh, uh, writing the book. I started putting the book together and Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of putting the book together once I got onto my full-time job. On a, as a side gig. And then I quit my full-time job just to do books. And now I'm doing podcasts, books. I've got another one next year. We've got two more that we're thinking of going on to. Once you do one, I think you'll be able to do more, but you've already paved the road. So for yeah. me, doing another book, I am not fearful uh, at all on uh, on anything. I've already, that first book has everything out there. So there ain't nothing that's going to be able to go. <laughs> so I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident going forward with other projects and things. And even this podcasting, uh, I, you know, I was, you know, getting on a camera. I was scared of that and having people see me, but then mm-hmm. I had to get into my voice. I had to get in. I didn't talk like this a year and a half ago. I had to get into that heart thing, the heart, uh, being able to speak from the heart that, that took me a long time. Oh my God. Uh, that was a long, cause I was just so locked up. Uh, and, um, uh, so now I'm able to do that naturally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I would imagine just the the training and the military life for 30 odd years, you can't very well go around with an open heart, <laughs> love and peace and all that. So I would imagine there was blowing concrete around yours. I was the best. I was the strongest. In other words, concrete, you can't touch me. Uh, I was one of the top notch of those guys. And uh 
but then uh, eventually everything uh, comes down and uh you, there's a there's a way that but uh yeah so but i was the top I, i'm from the south and the southern culture and plus the military and i started young and I, it started it started hard it started hard and i and i grew hard to it and um but then uh it, then it took a number on me it took a long time but uh, yeah i was i was hard yeah well, it sounds like writing the the book was your dynamite that blew blew <laughs> you open, eh? <laughs> blew me open. I definitely almost died blowing. <laughs> so yeah, blew me open definitely. And then the audio book helped me in the expression, uh, and I did that. Take ten, take twenty, and then and then I got into the podcasting, which I'll even more and more practice doing, and I just started to flow and I, I found a rhythm, uh, that I never had for, for years, never had that for years. No. And what does it feel like living from the heart, Jason? Oh, it's awesome. wonderful. It's sort of like liberating. It's, uh, it's yeah, just getting it out there and you're doing it. I've gotten over 50 podcasts, but it feels, uh, very, very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To be able to share yourself authentically, isn't it? And not be fearful and hide behind, a fake persona uh, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm yeah, so glad exactly. that you found your way to podcast. And I'd like to thank you for sharing your story because it does to me, for somebody that started out life with those challenges, you could say strikes against, you know, what's your life going to be? But look at what your life has been. And mm. the fact that you've survived bombs, I know you had a, a suicide death wish. <laughs> yeah, I had a, had a death wish over there. I was not scared, uh, which is not a good thing. So I had a death wish over there because my dad died. Just take me out, too. Let me go see my father. And this federal investigation, I had a double whammy. So to me, Afghanistan was really a not nothing. I was sort of, OK, whatever. I was at, I was at the point of, well, it don't matter anymore. Uh, it matter uh, anymore. You. It sounds as if you were in so much pain that you. It would have been, as you say, okay with you. Yeah, it would. It would be okay with me. Matter of fact, I was praying to die. Uh, I wanted to die in Afghanistan, not be main. My specific prayers were to be just totally eliminated. Yeah. Uh, and matter of fact, I did go after a suicide bomber in Afghanistan. I couldn't find him, but I. I <laughs> <laughs> which is see I'm uh, and so for me to go so I, there was a suicide bomber that uh, had come onto our base he didn't decide to blow himself up on our, on our base uh, thankfully but I got word that he was on base and so I went looking for him and I I, I just like I was out there openly I was I, I remember that I was not scared I had my weapon that was locked and cocked and uh, I had my whip I had my hand on my weapon I was expecting him to kill me or I kill him. And I had no fear at all. I remember that specifically. Um, and matter of fact, when the bombs came in anyway, I didn't care. It's like the sirens would go off and I would just walk out. I didn't run out. So that's how my state of mind was uh, when I was over there in Afghanistan, which yeah. troubled, it troubled my soldiers because they didn't want to see me die. Uh, oh, because, no. that, you know. that would not have been a good thing. Mm-hmm. So getting back to your second book, you chose to write it because it was a book that you desperately wanted to, you yeah. could have used, isn't it? It's something I could have used because I was getting out and there was no one there to help me to. So what it is, is when you get out of the military, you give your exit documents and your medical records to someone that's competent that can put up together in the government way to pro- to get you your benefits. So when you get out, you'll have benefits, uh, veterans benefits. And, and, I, and he wasn't there. He didn't want to help me. So I did it myself. And I did very well, matter of fact. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, I, I, and I learned a lot. I didn't want to do it, but uh, I did it. And then um, I said, well, one day, well, I, I can write a book about uh, getting the better. It's a, it's a self-help guide. It's with a lot of links, but um. I'm just, I'm not certified. I'm just telling you how I did it and how I approached it. So that's kind of why I did that one. Is that something you'd like to get into, Jason, and how people contact you so that you could? Well, yeah, I can support them and uh, get some answers to them. Um, When they, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on all the, on my website, jasonpike.org will get you to all the social media 
Um, I am not a representative. I'm not a veteran separate a veterans representative, but I can I can assist them, maybe lead them in the right direction, just like I would with the first book is just life in general. But um, I uh, I am mostly I'm going to be a writer and, and a speaker, a podcaster, and well, other books I'll have uh, that will come out there. But uh, yes, I can. A matter of fact, I helped someone out today on on some things, and um, I don't mind doing it because it just. When I help someone, I, I'm at that level in life where it probably helps me more to know that I'm helping somebody else. Yeah. yeah. That's why we do what we do <laughs> as a podcaster. And um, are you having your own show or are you just going oh, to be on others? Right now, I'm just being guest. I'm just going to be a yeah. guest. And uh, so I'll just be on multiple guest shows. And um, that's and then the third book I'm working on is toxic leadership and what to do in a wicked if you're in a wicked workplace and it's i mean toxic what is uh what are the what, what things you can do so that's my third book i've got the idea for the sixth book but uh i am going i'm going back into some deep dark times and uh but uh i know that i can do that because i've already been the first book so yeah, you, you you've yeah. got you've got evidence that you can survive it for sure <laughs> so listeners if you're interested in getting jason's book We'll have the links in the show notes and that'll take you to uh, your website. Do you do any book signings or anything when you release these? I have not done any. Uh, usually my signings are just if they want them, they request them in person, I'll, I'll sign them and I'll mail them to them. But I haven't been to the traditional book shows or the book, ev book events. Uh, I haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I guess if you choose to go that route, it'll be up on your website was where yes, I was going. My website. That. Okay. Yep. Jason, thank you so much for sharing with us today. It has been an absolute honor and a pleasure. And I hope, listeners, that you have found it insightful as well. That it seems when you're in it, the challenges may seem insurmountable. But as humans, we've got amazing spirits. We can rise above them. And I believe, as you mentioned, that's how we grow and continue to move on, isn't it? Oh, yes. I learned that many ways and more than once now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and being our guest today, Jason. It's been a privilege. Hey, anyway, take care, Anne. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at Anne at Understanding Grief. Dot com, or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.